I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and welcome to the concluding presentation in our series, Restoring Civil Liberties. That concluding uh, presentation is by me. It's an honor to be here with you tonight. Thank you for tuning in uh, to this conference. Uh, uh, thanks for supporting this conference with, with your donations. We were able to put it on. And the way it's turned out, it's it's just, we're, we're just so pleased with this thing. It's it's one of the best conferences we've ever had at FFF. Uh, I think it's, you know, I'm biased, but I think it's one of the best conferences and not the best conference on civil liberties in the whole history of the libertarian movement, at least the 32 years that FFF has been around. And what's really great is that, that all of these presentations are just timeless. You, you can go back and see them 50 years from now or have people see them then and you can gain as much from this this conference this series as as you can today and i think if everybody watches this entire series i think you'll know more about civil liberties than most lawyers and uh, maybe even most law professors uh, so uh, you'll notice my backdrop's different uh, than ordinary I, i'm here in san antonio as we were talking in the pre-show discussion, uh, the, the home of the Alamo. I grew up 150 miles from here, but my father was from San Antonio, San Antonio and we would spend our summers up here with, with my cousins and our Christmases. And uh, so I'm down here visiting a brother before Thanksgiving. And so <clears throat> welcome to Texas. <clears throat> I want to talk to you tonight about an, an aspect of civil liberties that, that, that Americans are not really accustomed to talking about. And it, yet it's a critically important part of civil liberties. Uh, you, you often hear people saying, uh, Jacob, we're losing our liberties in this country. We gotta do something, we're losing our liberties. Well, that ship sailed a long time ago and it, and it especially sailed after 9-11, the attacks on 9-11, that we lost our civil liberties <clears throat> even before then, but it was solidified after 9-11. You often hear also that, the idea of trading freedom for security. We should never trade liberty for security. Well, that ship sailed too, because that's exactly what Americans did after the 9-11 attacks. They traded their civil liberties for the sake of security, to be protected from the terrorists. That's what the global war on terrorism was all about. And the idea was just surrender your liberties to us and we will keep you safe from this extreme danger. So I want to talk to you about this part of our government, which we call the national security establishment. This is a part of what we call a national security state. That's our form of governmental structure, a national security state. And that consists primarily of the Pentagon, the, the, the military industrial complex, the CIA and the NSA, to a certain extent, the FBI. But one of the, the consequences of the 9-11 attacks is that it really brought to the forefront the power that the national security branch of the government holds within the governmental structure. And I, I call it a branch of government because that's really what it is. Now, I know we're taught in our civics classes that, that we have three branches of government, and that used to be the case before the federal government was converted to a national security state. You know, we were founded as a limited government republic. Well, that's a different type of governmental system from a national security state. It's actually the opposite. And after World War II, the conversion to a national security state took place. <clears throat> and with that came omnipotent powers and, and the, the supremacy of the national security branch of the government within the, the federal governmental structure, sovereign and supreme over the judicial branch, the legislative branch, the executive branch. Now, we're all taught, of course, that the military, the CIA, and the NSA fall within the executive branch. Uh, that's a fairy tale. Uh, the, the fact is, this is a, a separate branch of government. It is the most powerful branch of government. Uh, and it, it, its power was truly manifested in terms of, of civil liberties after the 9-11 attacks. Uh, the, the best example of this is what goes on in Guantanamo Bay and, and what happened at Guantanamo Bay. Now, this is a, a torture center. This is a so-called prisoner center that the Pentagon and the CIA established in Cuba as, as part of their imperialist base. And it is an imperialist base. It's part of the U.S. empire. It's, it's located in a foreign land. 
The United States has owned it since you know, the early 1900s or maybe the late 1800s. It was a product of the Spanish-American War when the U.S. government uh, helped defeat the Spanish Empire and then stepped in its shoes and says, well, we now control Cuba, even though Cuba had been led to believe that they were fighting for their independence. <clears throat> so they find themselves under U.S. government control. The U.S. installs a bunch of puppet regimes, and one of those puppet regimes gives this perpetual lease on very favorable terms like nominal rent uh, for this, this land in Cuba, foreign, foreign country. The U.S. essentially owns this. You couldn't find a better example of, of an imperialist outpost. Well, they, they took this imperialist outpost after the 9-11 attacks, and they, they declared this was going to be a prisoner center for their prisoners of war, which, which, which were the terrorists, you see, because they declared a global war on terrorism. And they said, we're, we're, we're going to go capture terrorists all over the world, and we're going to kill them. And the ones we capture, we're going to bring over here. And oh, by the way, everyone should know that this is going to be a constitution-free zone. Uh, in other words, there's going to be no Bill of Rights here. This is going to be total military control. No judicial interference, because we're in a foreign country. The, the Supreme Court doesn't have jurisdiction over here. Only the Cuban authorities have authority because this is their land. But of course, the, 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 the Pentagon and the CIA would never obey any orders from the, the communist regime on Cuba. So they were going to be totally independent and sovereign, which is kind of ironic because, you know, they all take an oath to support and defend the Constitution. And yet here they are forming a, a prisoner center that was really a torture center, too, uh, that they want to be independent of the Bill of Rights. Now, they're right wing. The, 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 the Pentagon, the CIA have always been right wing, extreme conservatives. Um, from the very beginning, you know, that was, you know, the anti-communist crusade. That was what the Cold War was about. That was the justification for the conversion to a national security state. And so they, they've always hated leftists and leftist groups. And they always considered the Bill of Rights, specifically the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments, like other conservatives do, as just constitutional technicalities that let guilty people go free. And they've railed against these kind of things. So now they're going to show how the cow's going to eat the cabbage here. They're going to have their model prisoner center, and, and which they, of course, converted immediately into a torture center. Well, the, the Supreme Court says, wait a minute, not, not so fast here. Uh, and when, when one of the petitions for writs of habeas corpus was brought up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said, no, 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 you are not sovereign and supreme. We, uh, in the judiciary, we have ultimate control over what you do there. And for a while, they, they granted some petitions for writ of habeas corpus, and they, they re released some prisoners. But after a certain point, the Pentagon drew the line and drew the line in the sand and said, OK, no more. You're, you're not going to cross this line. We control this thing. And the judiciary said, OK, we, we understand. You know, we, we won't cross that line. And so, for example, there's a there's a provision in the Bill of Rights for a speedy trial. And. Uh, so when the Supreme Court says, you've got to establish a system here for trying these terrorists, because while the Pentagon was saying, well, uh, terrorism is an act of war, and a lot of people were saying that after 9-11, that a lot of the libertarian interventionists were saying that, that they were supporting the invasion of Afghanistan. They were saying, oh, you know, the 9-11 attacks are an act of war. Well, they, they've never been an act of war. Uh, terrorism has always been a criminal offense. It's a federal criminal offense. It's in the U.S. Code. Uh, that's why there's federal criminal uh, uh, prosecutions in Northern Virginia, in Washington, New York, uh, elsewhere, uh, because it's an acknowledgement that, that terrorism is a, is a criminal offense. It's not an act of war. For example, if you take the 1993 attack on the World Trade Center, it was really no different in principle from the 9-11 attacks, you know, same tar target. Uh, and, and, well, in 9-11, they also had the Pentagon. Uh, but those people that were caught engaging in that act of terrorism in 1993 were brought to justice. They were prosecuted in federal district court. They're now serving penitentiary time. Uh, that's because, again, terrorism is, an, is a, a criminal offense. So the, 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 the Supreme Court essentially said to, to, the, uh, to the Pentagon, you, 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 you've got to establish this system and, of, of prosecuting terrorists, which is a phenomenal holding, you see, because now 
what, what the Pentagon did is they established their own judicial system there on Guantanamo Bay. So not only is it a torture center because they were torturing people from the very beginning, but it's a, a prisoner center and a judicial system. Now, so what you essentially have now and have for the last 20 years or so, a parallel judicial system for trying terrorism. Now, let me point out something that's obvious here. There is nothing in the constitution that grants the Pentagon and the CIA to establish a, judi a judicial system, nothing. Uh, so how do they get away with this? The, the judicial system for terrorism cases are right, is right here in the United States. But yet there it is. They've got a military tribunal. They have, uh, which is contrary to the Bill of Rights, which guarantees a jury trial. Uh, there's, uh, there's hearsay evidence that's admissible over there in the, in the Pentagon system when it's not admissible in the, in the constitutional system here in the United States. Now, what is hearsay? Hearsay is an out-of-court statement that's being offered for the truth of, the, of what it's being said. For example, if, if John Doe takes a witness stand and says, Joe Blow told me that the defendant, that he saw the defendant commit that robbery. Well, the defendant wants to cross-examine uh, Joe, Joe Blow. He's the guy that's accusing him of, of having seen this thing. He didn't want to cross-examine the guy that says, he told me this. And so the courts recognize that, that you've got a right to cross-examine and confront the actual witnesses. And that's why they don't allow hearsay evidence. In, in, the, in the Pentagon system, they allow for, uh, hearsay evidence. That's okay. In the Pentagon system, there's a presumption of guilt. Uh, that's, that's why they, they torture people as soon as they get there. Because in their minds, they're, they're guilty. I mean, they're, they're terrorists automatically. They, they don't need any military tribunal. They, now they've got a military tribunal in case there's ever a trial. Uh, but uh, over here, uh, you can't do that. You, you know, it's, it's, it's just forbidden. Uh, there's a presumption of innocence here. So there's no cruel and unusual punishments, either before conviction or after conviction. But in Guantanamo Bay, you have them both before and after. You've got people languishing there for 20 years. Which, which is, a, I think everyone would agree that's a violation of, the, of a speedy trial provision and the speedy trial provision in the Bill of Rights, uh, but they get away with it. The Supreme Court is, just defers to their authority and that's why there's 20 people there. Uh, I mean, they've been there for 20 years, I mean. Now, let me, let me mention something about habeas corpus here uh, because obviously while habeas corpus was operated a few times, it wasn't fully operative and it still isn't fully operative because the Supreme Court again has deferred to the, to the majestic power of the national security branch of the government. Uh, there's, there's, uh, that's why they've been there for 20 years. Now the way that habeas corpus works, well, let me first say habeas corpus is, is, has been described as the linchpin of a free society. I mean, it, it, it is the real workhorse. It's one of the greatest developments in the history of civil liberties. Maybe the greatest development. Any country that doesn't have a habeas corpus, I will guarantee you that is not a free country. And what the way habeas corpus operates is, let's say the DEA takes a drug war, suspected drug war violator into custody and says, well, we're not going to try you. We're just going to hold you in custody till you talk. Yeah, you tell us you know, where you got the drugs and who the cartel leaders are and so forth. And they just hold them there. Well, that person can file a petition for writ of habeas corpus in, in state court, uh, and if it's a federal offense in federal court, and the judge then issues the order to whoever holds him in custody and says, you will deliver this person to my court. And so they have to obey that order on, on pain of contempt. So they, they bring the, the defendant into the, into the court, and the judge says, give me the justification for this. Why you're holding them. And if they have no justification or no valid justification, the judge orders him released on the spot. He goes free. Or the judge will say, try him or release him. You're going to have to make a choice here. Give him a trial or release him. That's the power of habeas corpus. Okay. Now, it's obviously been nullified there in, in, in Guantanamo because otherwise <laughs> there wouldn't be people there for 20 years. So there, there's none of this try him or release him there. Now, let me digress for a minute here, because I think you can see that you've got two parallel systems here, and we'll return to these two parallel systems. 
But some of you that, that are familiar with my work know that I've long recommended a great book called National Security and Double Government by Michael Glennon. Now, Glennon was one of our speakers. Okay, It was a big honor to have him be here because his book has been very influential in my thinking uh, because it reinforced what I already suspected. Now, Glennon's not your crackpot pot author. Glennon, Glennon's book brings forth the following thesis. Uh, well, first of all, let me tell you about Glennon. I mean, he's a professor of law at Tufts University. Okay? He has served as counsel for Senate committees, I think maybe House committees too, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He's taught in Europe. I mean, this guy is stout. His book is very readable, scholarly, but very readable. His thesis is a very, very profound one. His thesis is that the real power of the federal government is wielded by this national security establishment, the Pentagon, the CIA, and the NSA. And that they, they simply permit the other three branches to maintain the veneer of power because they want people to feel like nothing's changed. They don't care about the veneer or the appearance of power. All they care about is they're the ones running the show. And when you, when you look at what's happening like at Guantanamo Bay, it, it confirms that thesis. The Supreme Court is just bowing out. Uh, that's why, the, again, there's been people there for 20 years without a trial. I mean, imagine the DEA does that. Uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration tries to hold a guy without a trial for, I mean, even just a year. There would be a petition for rid of habeas corpus, and I guarantee you the federal judges would order his release. Uh, try him or release him but not with the Pentagon. You see, there's, there's this, this zone of immunity of that, that they, they get to do whatever they want, and we're not going to interfere with them. And Congress is the same way. I mean, Congress is, does not interfere with these people. You, you can see this in the budget. For example, they're out of, of Afghanistan, where they were spending untold amounts of money, and yet Congress just voted them more money than ever. <laughs> I mean, even though they're not spending all that money in Afghanistan, you think, well, hey, let's reduce it by at least that much that you were spending in Afghanistan. Oh, no, they're giving them more. And that's the power. Now, most of the time, the president and the, the national security branch are on the same page, but not necessarily. If you look at Trump, for example, there's no question that the national security branch was firmly opposed to Trump. And, and they, they, they surfaced when, when General Milley, you heard that story, I'm sure, uh, telephones the Chinese dictators and says, look, we just want to make it clear that there's not going to be a nuclear war here. Don't, don't pay any attention to Trump if he starts making waves or, or trouble. I mean, what he was essentially saying is, we here in charge, not Trump. And so that's what, what Glennon is saying, that that's the real power here. And that power is manifested in this, this judicial system, in this torture camp, in this prison camp. The fact that it even exists and the courts have permitted it to exist with no constitutional authority whatsoever. Now, we know that the, the military handles its own uh, criminal justice matters within the military. And that's what the Uniform Code of, of Military Justice is about. They have their own judicial system, uh, court marshals, and so forth. But that deals with soldiers. This is people who are accused of terrorism, that you've, they've established this separate parallel judicial system. Now it's parallel to the, to the American constitutional system. They're running side by side. So notice what can happen here. You can have two people both involved in the same terrorist act and the military decides how they're gonna be treated. And so the, the military can say, well, well, let him, the, this person over here go over to the constitutional system, and this person over here is going to go over to the military system, and he's going to be tried as a terrorist there. Well, he, the, the difference, of course, is black and white. I mean, anybody's right mind is going to pick the old constitutional system because you, you have a better chance of acquittal, if nothing else, there, but you're going to be treated better if you're in a federal penitentiary than you are at this torture center. Uh, but notice who's making the call on this. It's, it's, it's not the, the civilian authorities, it's the military authorities. Now, you've heard the, the expression rule of law. Okay? It's one of the most misunderstood terms in, in the legal lexicon. The mainstream press gets it all wrong. The members of Congress get it all wrong. Well, most people get it wrong. They think that the rule of law is when people are obeying the law. You, know, you see this like in immigration cases. 
that, that these people can't be permitted to violate the law, the immigration laws when they're coming in illegally, because we have the rule of law. And the rule of law says you've got to obey the law. Well, that's not what the rule of law is about. The rule of law is a completely different concept. What the rule of law is that it says is that in terms of criminal conduct, people should always have to answer only to a law, not to the discretion of some government official. And if they have to, to answer to just arbitrary edicts of some dictator, that's what violates the rule of law. The rule of law says, if, take for example, a drug violation. Suppose there was no drug laws. And the president of the United States says, well, I think it's bad for people to take drugs. Arrest that guy over there. He's smoking dope. Put him in jail. And the rest of them put him in jail. That's a violation of the rule of law because you first should have to get a law and then everybody answers to that law and everybody's treated equally under that law. That's another principle. There's no discretion here in terms of if you want to go after somebody for, let's say the law is prohibiting marijuana, you've got to follow the law here. And let's say there's somebody you know, snorting cocaine. Well, you can't do anything against him if the law doesn't say that cocaine snorting is illegal. Now, the other thing about the rule of law is that everybody's going to be treated equally under sim similar circumstances. So here with this parallel judicial system, it's a classic example of a violation of the rule of law because you've got discretion here. You've got two people who are accused of committing the exact same terrorist act, but one gets this really good system, depending on the discretion of, of military officials or CIA officials. One gets the real rotten system, which is the military system, where, get, where guilt is a guarantee. I mean, I guarantee you there's not going to be anybody acquitted in the, in the military system if, if the military doesn't want it happening. I mean, you've got military officials up there on the jury. I mean, you know, they, they depend on promotions as compared to a jury system, you know, where our ancestors, that's why they put it in the Bill of Rights. They didn't want tribunals. They didn't want judges deciding guilt. They wanted the accused to have the right to, to have just regular people in the community decide guilt or innocence. Uh, and that's what trial by jury was all about. Well, that's been nullified. The whole Bill of Rights has been nullified, uh, at least with respect to criminal justice matters, uh, but probably also freedom of speech. Who has freedom of speech at Guantanamo? Uh, so you've got, you've got these parallel systems that constituted tremendous, tremendous a violation of civil liberties. Now, what about American citizens? Well, they've been nice. The, the, the military and the CIA, their, their informal policy was, well, we're going to let Americans suspected of terrorism go into their domestic system. But it's a discretionary thing. There, there's absolutely no nothing inherent that would cause them to or force them to have Americans turn into that, be turned over to that system. Uh, they very well could say, we, we were now changing our policy. So if there's another terrorist attack, uh, and there very well could be here on American soil because they're still killing people in the Middle East. They've gotten out of Afghanistan, but they're still killing people in the Middle East. And it, that very well may generate another massive terrorist attack here with the anger and rage that, that those killings generate. And so let's, let's assume that they, they blow up you know, some bridge over the Mississippi or whatever, kill hundreds of people. Uh, big crisis environment. Suppose there's an economic and financial crisis dealing with, with all this inflationary uh, policies that the Federal Reserve are doing. Suppose that all this comes together in a perfect storm of financial crisis, economic crisis, terrorism crisis, then all bets are off. And, and there very easily could be roundups of American citizens and shunted into the military system, uh, a la the Guantanamo. Uh, the, you know, similar type of thing happened in World War II. During that crisis, where they rounded up Japanese Americans, they were these were citizens of America. They put them under military control. So that's the type of thing that can happen, and it's the law. This is when I say that civil liberties were traded away, that they that they were destroyed. I meant it. That's now the law, and and it was firmly established law by the federal judiciary in the case of Jose Padilla. This is an American citizen that they took into custody, military custody. He, he started out in, in, the, in, the, in the, the judicial system the, in, domestically. He was before a federal court and the military seized him. And, and they, they, they 
the civilian authorities that cooperated with this, but essentially they seized him and said, no, we want him in the military system. And the federal courts went along with it. They affirmed that. And of course, we were fighting it at the Future of Freedom Foundation. And we got the standard attacks. Oh, you guys support terrorism and so forth. Uh, you guys love the terrorists. And people didn't understand that you have to fight for the principle because the government for a test case is always going to come up with the most unsavory person they can find. And that was Padilla. Uh, and so then, you know, it's, it makes it more difficult in terms of the, the mainstream public of, of coming to his defense because people can't understand why are you defending this unsavory guy? Well, the reason is because whatever law is established for him applies across the board to other Americans. And that's why we were, we were making such a strong case. You could go Google Jose Padilla on our website and you'll see any number of cases we were where we were writing on the Padilla case and linking articles with respect to the Padilla case. Well, the federal courts affirmed the power of the military and the CIA to do this to Americans. And they were torturing Padilla too. So the, the, the power to torture Americans is now solidified there. Well, there, there's just no way you can, you can live in a free society where this power exists. Uh, and, you know, now some people think, well, Jacob, they're not exercising the power. You don't see it widespread. Okay, they did it with Padilla, but that's just one. But that's not the test of a free society. The test of a free society is whether they wield the power. Like, you know, they, they, they have a sword that's in its sheath that they can pull out whenever they want. The, the, the free societies where they don't have the sword at all. That's what the Bill of Rights is. It, it de prohibited this type of thing. And that's, of course, what's been nullified. Now, let me, let me address the, another great big power here. And that's the power of assassination. And I will say it again, that you, you cannot have a free society if you're living under a, a system where the government's got the power of assassination. And that's exactly what we're living under. Now, it's always been the case ever since the CIA got established in 1947 that they had the power of assassination. They assumed the power. And again, the courts as far back as the 1950s just deferred to that power. And yet that was not the type of government that we had when we got started. It wasn't the type of government that existed for 150 years. You've got an express prohibition against assassination, thanks to our ancestors in the Fifth Amendment uh, that says no person shall have his life taken without due process of law. And due process of law means notice and a trial. And before you can kill somebody, you got to give them formal notice of what, what you're, what you're going to kill them about. What's, what's the charge here? You know, what's, what's the law that they have violated? And then you got to give them a trial. You got to convict them. They're presumed innocent. You got to come in and you got to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that they really did this. Uh, so our ancestors didn't want to live under a system of uh, where the government's got the power of assassination. That it's clear by the Fifth Amendment. Well, the CIA comes into existence and says, we now have the power of assassination. That, and that's inherent to a national security state form of governmental structure. North Korea is a national security state. And um, you, you'll recall a few years ago, the the, the, they, they went out and assassinated the, the brother of the dictator there. Or the, I think he was the brother. Uh, and he was in another country. And the mainstream press here in the United States, you know, just indignant and outraged. Oh, I can't believe that this dictatorial regime goes out and assassinates this guy. And yet they, they don't look here in the mirror that here in the United States, that's the kind of system we live under, where the national security establishment has the power of assassination. And it's a non-reviewable power that many years ago, the, the Supreme Court said, we're not going to get involved in this, that they called it the, the political question doctrine. And they said, we're, we don't have any expertise in political questions. And this is, this is the matter for the president and the Pentagon, the CIA to determine. And they're the experts on foreign policy. So if they decide to do a regime change operation or an assassination, you're never going to get second guessed by the, by the judiciary, even though it's the job of the judiciary under our system of government to enforce the Fifth Amendment. But they've carved out this whole zone of immunity to the most powerful branch. This is Glennon's theory, thesis again, that they maintain the power. They let the judiciary and the Congress and the president have the appearance of power, but with real power like assassination the Supreme Court's not going to do anything with it. This is a political question. And sure enough, you know, they've assassinated people in the past. They assassinated uh, Patrice Lumumba, the, the head of the Congo. Uh, he hadn't done anything. 
I mean, <laughs> they suspected him of being a communist. This was during the Cold War when there was a massive assault on civil liberties, you know, COINTELPRO with the FBI, spying on Americans. Back then, the big bugaboo was communism. The communists are coming to get us. We, we, we're going to keep you safe from the communists. We're going to convert the federal government to a national security state. We're going to keep you safe. Just turn your liberties over to us. And Americans did. Uh, the, the whole Cold War was about violating civil liberties, trading civil liberties to keep us safe from the communists. Uh, so you've got, you've got this, this system of assassination. Uh, in, in 73, they, or I guess it was 70, 1970, they, the, the CIA orchestrated the kidnapping and assassination of a, of a general in, in, in Chile. His name was Rene Schneider. He hadn't done anything to, against the United States. He's a very honorable man. He had a family. But his crime was that he was standing in the way of a, of a coup there in Chile. And so the, the CIA and said, well, we can't stand for this. So they orchestrated his kidnapping. He got shot dead on the, on the streets of Santiago. Uh, when the heirs sued, the court said, no, you, you can't sue for this. You can't recover for this. This, this is uh, something that we can't judge. This is a, the political question doctrine again, which they created out of whole cloth as a way to justify their deference to the authority of the national security establishment. And notice something, and, and of course they, they uh, after 9-11, they, they assassinated a American citizen named Anwar al-Awlaki, along with his 16-year-old son, Abdul Rahman. Uh, and their, their rationale here was that these were threats to national security and, and that they have, a, they have the authority to assassinate anybody that they consider is a threat to national security. And they decide who is the threat to national security. They decide what national security means because there's no objective meaning to that term. It's whatever meaning they, they determine. And there's another thing you, you should keep in mind. And the courts upheld uh, this, this power of assassination. They, they refused to interfere. The, the father tried to bring an injunction stopping them from, from assassinating uh, his son, Anwar al-Awlaki, and the courts threw him out on his ear. They're not going to interfere with the power of assassination. Now, and there's something else to keep in mind here. They, they have the power of assassinating not just private Americans, but any government official. Because, hey, you know, a terrorist is a terrorist. A communist is a communist. Uh, arguably, a, an American uh, federal official who's a threat to national security is much more dangerous than a private citizen who's a threat to national security. He's inside the government being a threat. So... Again, as long as you live in a society where the government wields this omnipotent power, there's no way you can be considered free. It's just impossible because it, it has to influence your life when you know that they can come after you. Uh, they, they, you know, the First Amendment's great, but until you, you realize, hey, they can kill me and get away with it, nobody's going to go to jail if they kill you. All I got to do is say he was a threat to national security. And you can see the dangers that we're now heading into because they're they're changing their focus on their war on terrorism domestically. They're saying, oh, you know, the January 6th terrorists. You hear that all the time now, the January 6th terrorists. And, and Brenna, the ex-CIA director, lumped libertarians in it as, a, as these dangerous forces. And, uh, and so they're, they're setting the framework here for this, this global war on terrorism to move domestically. All they need is a good terrorist attack here on American soil, which again, they can generate with their, their killings overseas which they're still doing, even though they're not doing it in Afghanistan anymore. Now, let me, let me digress at this point and, and talk about Afghanistan, or specifically 9-11, because it's critical to the analysis here on what we need to do to restore these civil liberties. Uh, do, you know, due process of law and trial by jury and right to speedy trial to restore what our ancestors gave us. 9-11 is critical in understanding what happened on 9-11, uh, because there's the interventionists, including libertarians who, who were calling for the invasion of, of Afghanistan, number one, they were saying it was an act of war. Um, it wasn't an act of war. It, 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 it's just, you know, the, again, the U.S. code. And remember 1993, World Trade Center. Also, the attack on the USS Cole. That, that, that's being prosecuted as a federal criminal offense. So it is a federal criminal offense. You can, you can just Google terrorism cases, federal court. You can see they're brought in federal district court. Well, but the other thing was the motive behind 9-11. And this is what people didn't want to talk about. We talked about it at FFF, and man, we were inundated with hate mail. I've never seen so much hate mail in all my life. 
I mean, we had you know cancellations of support that we, we love the terrorists, you know, all the silly accusations that you 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 hate if you love if you hate it here, go elsewhere, move away. You hate America and all this because we were saying we need to examine what motivated these guys. Um, and, and so they were saying, oh, you're just justifying it. That was one of their favorite attacks. You're just justified because nobody wanted to focus on the CIA and the military. The, the CIA and the military are like gods. I mean, they're just, they're like real gods. They can do no wrong in the minds of many people. And so, you know, when we were saying we need to look and see what they were doing before 9-11, oh my gosh, people hit the fan. Same thing happened to Ron Paul, as y'all recall, in that big 2008 presidential debate with all the Republican opponents and the Republican audience. And they were all saying, oh, they came over here because they hate us for our freedom and values. And, and Ron was the only one that said, no, that's not true. They came over here because our government's been over there killing them for years, killing thousands, hundreds of thousands of people over there, first with the Gulf War, then with the, uh, the sanctions that were killing Iraqi children by the scores. Uh, Madeleine Albright's infamous statement, she was U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. She was a the government's spokesman to the nation's na uh, spokesman to the world. She said the deaths of half a million Iraqi children from the sanctions, while difficult, were worth it. Uh, you had uh, stationing of troops near Mecca and Medina, the holiest lands in the Muslim religion. So all of this, and then you had the terrorists in 93, Ramsey Youssef, the blind sheik, going before federal judges saying, this is why we're, we committed this terrorist attack. And you see it in, in bin Laden's uh, declaration of war too, that they're stationing these troops. You got the sanctions killing these children. That's what was motivating. That's why these guys came over here and committed suicide. That's not defending what they did. You go after them. We always said, go after them with criminal prosecutions, which is what they did with the 93 attackers. That's why they're sitting in a federal penitentiary. But let's examine here before we run headstrong into Afghanistan, what motivated these guys? Be, and by not doing that, including libertarians that were supporting it, and to this day still support it, they don't want to look at motive because going into Afghanistan was just doubling down on what they were doing before 9-11 that generated the anger and the rage that motivated these people to come all the way over here, commit suicide, and kill as many people as they could. So they, they invade Afghanistan, and they're doing more of the same. They're killing more people which of course then generates the big global war on terrorism, constant threat of terrorist retaliation. They double down and invade Iraq with all these lies about WMDs and all this to get people behind them. And then they're killing people there, people who never did anything against the United States. And so you had, that's why the global war on terrorism was perpetual. I called it in the post 9-11 era, I called it the greatest terrorist producing machine in history. Because with every bomb that they would drop on a wedding party or a family or even Taliban soldiers. They all have families or Iraqi soldiers. They all have families that they were generating their own terrorist demand, which then they used to get the Patriot Act, to get the pat downs at the airports, all the FISA court secrecy. And this is where the crackdown came as a, as a product 9-11. So my point is, if they had never engaged in pre-9-11 interventionism, you would have had, never had 9-11. You wouldn't have had the pat downs at the airports. Things would have been, you know, a semblance of pre-9-11 normality. No Patriot Act, no telecom scandals, no NSA mass secret surveillance. I mean, they were, sure, they were surveilling people, but nothing to the extent of what happened after 9-11. That's why we have to continually focus on, on what motivated, why motive is so important on 9-11, even today, because like I said, they're killing people in the Middle East. This is what generated the 9-11 attacks. And then their subsidiary argument, of course, in addition to that they hate us for our terror, our freedom and values, you know, they, they hate us for our rock and roll and our churches and so forth. They, they, there was also that subsidiary argument that there's this conspiracy to impose a caliphate on the United States, you know, a Muslim caliphate. And, and you'll recall, man, the paranoia that, I mean, it's ironic that they're all mandating everybody to wear masks today because in the, in the after 9-11 era, the Muslim women would wear burqas or I don't know what the, the garb is where they have half their face covered and everybody went ballistic. Oh my God, they're covering their faces and now they're mandating covering faces. It's kind of ironic. But I mean, remember the paranoia? Sharia law, they're trying to establish Sharia law in the public schools. The Muslims are coming. They've been on this caliphate 
crusade since the, the Middle Ages and they're finally reaching America. And it was just pure nonsense, pure, absolute nonsense. But it was nonsense. It was believed. I mean, like I say, we lost tons of support and we lost a board member at FFF that, that said that that said that we were clueless on foreign policy because we were keep saying, focus on the Pentagon, focus on the, in the CIA, don't invade these countries. You're only going to make it worse. It's like throwing gasoline on a fire. And we still need to do that because they're still killing people over there. All right. So, so those are the lessons of the destruction of civil liberties at the hands of the national security state. Let me, let me just address uh, briefly some domestic violations that, that have turned essentially permanent of civil liberties. Uh, the big one, of course, relates to the drug war. Uh, I mean, this is the massive violator of civil liberties. It, if, you, if you take the judicial opinions on car searches, for example, and there's tons of them, uh, and they're all bad, or at least most of them are bad, uh, I will guarantee you that 95%, this is just a guess, but 95, 96%, if not more, deal with drug cases or immigration cases. And so you, the, the drug war has served as a great violator of civil liberties in terms of search and seizure, the evisceration of the Fourth Amendment, especially with respect to, to car searches. And then you've got the no-knock raids. Just imagine going and bashing a person's door down in the middle of the night uh, and, and having to, them to make a split decision. You know, if the guy's a drug dealer in there, he has to make a split decision. Is this a rival drug gang that's coming to kill him or are these legitimate cops? And it could be a drug gang that addressed his cops because of these no-knock raids to make sure they don't flush their marijuana down the toilet. Uh, you've got um, for, uh, civil asset forfeiture, which is just stealing, direct stealing. They, they just stop cars on the highway that, that have Hispanics or Blacks in them, uh, older model cars. They, and they, they lure them, they seduce them into admitting that they got cash. And they just seize it. They take the cash. That's the law that they can take the cash. And if the person that like it, he can sue. A lot of these people, poor people, they deal in cash. If they're going to go buy a car, they, they carry $10,000 with them. And once they lose the $10,000, how are they supposed to hire a lawyer without any money? And so that they just forfeit. A lot of the money is just forfeited because people can't sue. They don't have the money to sue. So it's been a big bonanza for the DEA, the, the state law enforcement officers, the, the, for the state officials, the sheriffs and so forth. It's like a self-funding fiefdom. They don't have to depend on the, the city council or the county commissioners or the state legislature for funding, at least not for all their funding. They, they're funding themselves. Uh, that's not what a, what a democratic system is supposed to be all about. Uh, it's the legislative branch is supposed to have the power of the purse. They're over here funding themselves with their seizures. Uh, and, and then, of course, you have the harassment of Blacks. Um, one of the best uh, exchanges I, I've seen in this whole thing on, on, on harassment of Blacks, because you know the drug war is, is, is the greatest opportunity for a bigoted cop, because he can stop whoever he wants, and search and seizure, and search and seize whatever he wants, harass, humiliate, berate. Uh, either a, a Black walking down the street or driving a car, and he's got the per Perfect excuse, drug war. And everybody just hails him, oh, thank you for saving our society from drugs. When he's just a bigot and he's using the drug war to do this. Well, one of the best exchanges, that, I forget what the guy's first guy's first name is, but his name is Simon. He, he did The Wire, he's a producer for The Wire, which is about the drug war in Baltimore. And I think he was, I think it was Christian Amapur, I may be mistaken, but the, the interviewer was asking him, what should we do about this problem with you know, black harassment of blacks? And, 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 and Simon was great. He just says, wait, you just need to get rid of the drug war. You just legalize drugs. And it just went right over her head. If, if it was Christian, I'm, a, I'm not sure it was, but if whoever it was, it went right over her head. It was a woman and, and, and he says, uh, she says, no, but let's talk about the harassment of blacks. What would you do specifically to solve that problem? And Simon was great. He says, well, my answer is the same. Just legalize drugs, <laughs> get rid of the drug war. And that's really the answer. You got to just get rid of the great drug war. Don't don't trim the branches here. Don't settle for legalizing marijuana and leave cocaine and heroin and opioids and all. That. Look, the gov federal government, the state governments, no government's got any legitimate authority interfering with what a person puts into his mouth. You find a society like that, whether it's North Korea, Burma, uh, Mexico, or whatever, you're not living in a free society. The only free society is one where 
You can put whatever you want in your mouth, no matter how dangerous, and there's nothing the government can do about it. And that's the America that Americans lived under for more than 150 years. America, Americans understood that was an essential aspect of liberty. So to get rid of the civil, civil asset forfeiture and harassment of Blacks, you can work on, the, on those angles, okay, but don't settle for that, because that's not freedom. Reform is never freedom. And those of you that are familiar with our work at FFF know that we don't ever call for reform. Reform is not freedom. Re reform is reform of, of infringements on freedom. The last thing I want to mention is, is uh, immigration controls, because this is another massive violation of civil liberties. And, and I know there's, there's some libertarians who support immigration controls. They're conservative-oriented, or they might even be Democrat-oriented. I mean, both Democrats, liberals, progressive, whatever label you want to put on them, socialists, and conservatives, they all believe in this system of immigration controls. But you should understand something. With immigration controls come a police state. So anybody who supports immigration controls automatically supports a police state. Now, they might say, well, Jacob, wait, wait a minute, stop right there. I don't support a police state. I'm a libertarian, but I support immigration controls. Well, that's like saying I support lightning, but I don't support thunder, Jacob. I'm opposed to thunder, but I favor lightning. Well, you know, thunder comes with lightning and, and a police state comes with immigration control. So if you support immigration control, as you support a police state. And in the American Southwest, where I grew up, and where I'm living, and where I am right now in San Antonio, there is a police state along the border. Uh, it, for example, I grew up on a farm on the Rio Grande, literally on the Rio Grande. The Border Patrol had the authority, to, and, and still does, to come onto our farm anytime it wanted and search to its heart's content. Now, we lived on the farm. They, they never once demanded to come into our house, but I presume they have the authority to do that because they have full authority on the border. But they, I guess they, they figured that would be pushing things, but they would drive around our farm to their heart's content, searching for illegal immigrants without a warrant. Okay. So total visceration of the fourth amendment. If we put a lock on our gate, they would shoot it off if we hadn't given them a key. And this is the same with ranchers all along the border and even away from the border. I think I forget what the distance is, a hundred miles or so they can go into any ranch and ranchers will tell you, you know, one of the rule of ranching is you always leave a gate the way you find it. When you go through the gate, if it's closed, you close it. If it's open, you leave it open. The border patrol would go through closed gates and just leave them open. Ranchers, ranchers in South Texas will tell you that. It's just the arrogance of power. And then you've got these highway checkpoints, which are found in communist countries where they stop people and demand papers and can search you within the United States, even though you've never gone to, into Mexico. When you leave Laredo, for example, and you're headed to San Antonio, you go out like 40 miles north on Interstate 35, and you go over a crest of a hill, and all of a sudden, you're, you're gonna think you're in Mexico because you're approaching this immigration station, massive immigration station, that looks like you're approaching the border. It looks exactly the same. Now, it's understandable, that they would enforce their immigration controls on the border, like at the international bridge that crosses the Rio Grande. They've got that. This is 40 miles north. So anybody who leaves Laredo that never even goes into Mexico has to stop at this thing. Well, if, if they're dark skinned and they, they, they can't speak English well, or they, they're driving an older car, they better have their papers with them. And, and I know people that have had this experience. They've got to carry their passport with them. They're Americans. But, you know, I would estimate 20 to 25 percent of, Amer of Laredoans can't speak English and uh, they better have their papers with them because they will be sent back to Laredo. They will not be allowed to to take They'll be taken into custody and then they got to prove that they're an American citizen or they'll be deported. Uh, and, and, and but even you know, those of us that, that are there, they may have a nicer car and they'll say American citizen. You have to answer if you don't. They will pull you out of the car and they will beat you up. If you leave your door locked and your windows up, they will bash it in. They will tell you, turn your head because you're going to have glass flying into your eye if you don't. But then they will bash it in. They'll unlock your car and they will pull you out and they will beat you up. And that's what happened to a pastor in Arizona. And they'll search your vehicle too. You have to open your trunk. Uh, and so that's how they caught Willie Nelson with drugs. He was just one of these checkpoints because they're not only north of Laredo. They run east-west on the interstate highway system uh, in Arizona, New Mexico. I mean, this is not a free society. That is what a police state is all about. 
And that's just two of the examples on this immigration police state. So in other words, what we need to do to restore civil liberties in our land, we got to strike the root. We got to start talking, thinking at a higher level of what does it mean to be free? What does a free society entail? And it necessarily entails a removal of infringements on freedom, not their reform. And I think a good starting point is the good, solid, positive founding principles of this country, starting with the Declaration of Independence. Uh, now, we know there were some bad founding principles, slavery, violation of women's rights, and so forth. I'm saying let's start with the good founding principles, and, and let, let's examine the violations, the deviations, the abandonment, the rejection of those principles, and let's determine whether those things should be wiped out. Those infringements should be wiped out so that we restore liberty by restoring the sound founding principles that later generations after 150 years with the Cold War and then the global war on terrorism uh, decided to abandon and reject. And we've got a great opportunity now. We have the same opportunity to restore a limited government republic that we did at the end of the Cold War. And instead, we let the Pentagon, the CIA go into the Middle East and start killing people to the point where they finally got the 9-11 attacks. Right now, with the evacuation of, of Afghanistan, this country is under absolutely no threat of invasion by any nation state. Nobody's got the money, nobody's got the resources, nobody's got the manpower, the, the military capability of crossing the oceans, invading the United States. We have a great opportunity right now to restore a limited government republic, which is the necessary prerequisite for the restoration of civil liberties on the national security state side, we also have a great opportunity with the drug war teetering to restore civil liberties in that area. And then of course, restore civil liberties by restoring America's founding system of open immigration. With doing that and, and adhering to these principles, we got a chance to lead the world to the highest reaches of freedom that mankind has ever seen. And now would be a good place to start. Thank you very much. And now I'll open it up for some Q and A. And let me see, I've handled these all with other speakers and. I will do it myself now. Okay, let's start with the first one. Will FFBF be making transcripts of the speeches and publishing them in a Kindle or PDF book? Oh, that's an interesting question and implicitly an interesting suggestion. We haven't really given that some thought, but that is something worth looking at because all of these speeches and these presentations have been so fantastic. All of them. I mean, I'm, we're just stunned at how great this conference has turned out to be. That thanks for the suggestion. Um, we will certainly give that serious consideration. Okay, how do we know that the national security branch of government is, is a fourth branch of government and not part of the executive branch? Well, because it's who has the the ultimate say uh, that in a in a fight with the the president and the national security branch. I would submit that it's the national security branch. They, they are the nullifier. Uh, and that's why General Milley called up the, the, the Chinese uh, dictator. You know, he said, look, we want to establish here that, that what he was really saying is Trump's not ultimately in charge. I am. General Milley is in charge. And, and he's, so that if, they, if he's making trouble that might lead to a nuclear war, don't worry about it. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty flat out answer. That, that, that the military is in charge here. Uh, and and if, if, you, if you look at, at any other disputes, may, many of you know that I've done a lot of work on the, on the Kennedy assassination. No doubt in my mind, this was a regime change operation that was no different in principle from the regime change operations that took place before and after. Kennedy was deemed to be a threat of na to national security. Um, and it, remember, they have ultimate say on who constitutes a, a threat to national security. Now, what was really revealing about this was what happened 10 years later or seven years later, uh, that when, when Salvador Allende was elected president of Chile, uh, he was doing what Kennedy was doing, had been doing. He was reaching out to the Soviet Union, you know, Russia, you know, the, the, the big bugaboo Russia and, and Cuba and establishing friendly relations. Well, that, that was what Kennedy was doing too. And so they, they consider that a threat to national security uh, because you're either with us or against us during the Cold War. And when, when you, you, I mentioned uh, General Schneider a few minutes ago, Schneider said, no, 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 we're not, we're not gonna oust this, our president. 
He's democratically elected. Our constitution provides only for impeachment and elections as a way to get rid of him. And we're not going down that road. And so the, the CIA and the, and the military said, no, 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 you don't have that luxury. He is a threat to your national security. You have a duty to oust him from power. And so that's when they orchestrated the, the kidnapping and assassination of, of Schneider. They got rid of him and they prevailed on the Chilean military that says, you have a moral duty to get rid of your president. That shows their mindset, that they are the ultimate determiners they, of whether a president constitutes a threat to national security or not. And they had the power. Uh, they, they had the power in 63 to do it. They had the power in 73 uh, when the national security branch of Chile did the same thing. They, they fired missiles at, at Allende trying to kill him, assassinate him. That, that failed, and, uh, but they ultimately prevailed. There was, there, was a, there was a war between two branches of government. And I think some of you may know we've, we've published a great book called JFK's War with the National Security Branch, National Security Establishment, why he was assassinated. That there was a real war going on between the National Security Branch and the Executive Branch, just as there was a real war between those two branches in Chile. Okay, next question. Why do you think the judiciary and legislative branch capitulate to the national security state? Well, the legislative branch is just co-opted. I mean, you, you, you've got, for, for one thing, you've got assets there now. You've got military veterans, CIA veterans that they've been running for office. They're, they're considered heroes. And I guarantee you, their loyalty is going to be the, to the national security uh, establishment. I mean, they're, they're not going to, they may carp or whatever about military spending or some jet or whatever, but they're never going to challenge the existence of, of a national security state. And that's what matters to the national security state. Their, their worst fear is that there's awakening in America and, and uh, Americans say, hey, wait a minute. You mean we were a limited government republic and we were supposed to have that back at the end of the Cold War? Well, well what's going on here? And that's their biggest fear. That's why they need these threats. In addition to that, uh, they, where they have their assets planted all through Congress, they also have all these military projects all across the country. In, I, I would say probably every congressional district around. So if a, if a member of Congress decides to take them on, they can start canceling these military projects. And then you know what, where the press is going to go with that, the local press. Oh, we have an ineffective congressman. He's cost us jobs for our community. He took on the heroes in the Pentagon. Uh, he deserves to be ousted. And so they have that, that, that big hammer over everybody's head. That's why they have these military uh, bases and posts and, and projects all across the country uh, to keep congressmen in line. And, and, and of course, there's, there's that sense of retaliation with the CIA. I mean, uh, C Congressman Schumer said this, you know, he says uh, with Trump, when Trump was fighting the national security establishment, uh, Schumer says it's not a smart thing to do because the intelligence community has six ways to Sunday of retaliating. And they do. I mean, you know, somebody could get an IRS audit and never know that it came from the IRS. Uh, I mean, from the, uh, from the CIA, you, you would never know. Uh, but you know, there's no doubt in my mind that if the CIA is going to have assets in the mainstream press, a la their Operation Mockingbird, and they're going to be expanding power within Congress to maintain their control over the purse and the, and the Pentagon too. So no question in my mind, they're going to be acquiring assets in every part of the executive branch of the government. Uh, so that's how you know that they're that they're that they're a fourth branch of government. Now, they're also the most powerful. Oh, why do they capitulate? Because they're the most powerful branch. Power, government is power. This is where the guns are. This is where the tanks are. The jet planes. And so when Allende took on the national security branch, he was up there in the national palace. He had a he had a military helmet on. The other people in the executive branch they had assault rifles. Uh, Allende had assault rifles. His position was, was surrounded by infantry troops, by uh, armor troops, and he was holding them off, firing back. He had these two branches firing, but it, there were no match for the national security branch. So the national security branch calls in the Air Force and starts firing missiles at, at, at the executive branch, trying to assassinate uh, Allende. Uh, and finally, Allende, you know, he was left dead at, at the end of it. They say he committed suicide. Uh, regardless, he was dead because of the coup. And the, his allies there surrendered. Nobody can stand up against this. And the judiciary understands that. They, and so they, they come up with these excuses that make it look like they have the veneer of power, like the political question doctrine. 
Because imagine, suppose they, they issue an order uh, that, that the military's got, let's say on the Vietnam War, there's no declaration of war. So it's the job of the judiciary to enforce, enforce the constitution. There's no declaration of war. They should have ordered, you got to come home immediately without a declaration of war. We're ordering the, the head of the Pentagon, the secretary of defense to bring all troops home. Well, the Pentagon would have ignored the order. They knew they would ignore the order. I mean, can you imagine a deputy U.S. Marshal going up to the Pentagon and serving this, this order? And then suppose they don't order, then you cite them for contempt. And, and you've got the 82nd Airborne Division when the marshals come by to serve the order of contempt to, or, to, or to arrest the, the head of the Pentagon, the joint the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But what, a team of marshals is going to be able to do that with the 82nd Airborne Division backed up by a team of CIA assassins? It ain't going to happen. And the judiciary knows that. And so instead of creating a conflict like that, that exposes the sheer power of this fourth branch of government, they create these ridiculous notions like the political question doctrine. Okay, can Jacob discuss the backflips that the Pentagon, et cetera, did to justify using tortured confessions at Gitmo trials? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think they had to use too many backflips because uh, that, you know, they, their arguments have been pretty much there at to the to the military judges I mean, it's been very difficult for them to get into the federal court system on the basis of their of the torture there um, and the military judges there said we're not going to hear it the, the the government the government's position is to to let them talk about these confessions would violate national security because it would it would divulge to the world their secret ways of torturing people and the military judges have bought that, that argument. Uh, now, there was recently a conviction, and the military tribunal quite predictably, predictably uh, convicted and, and gave, I don't know, a 20 year sentence or something. And, but lo and behold, it was shocking. The military judge, for some reason or another, permitted evidence of the torture. And it was brutal. I mean, you read what they did to this guy, it's just horrendous. I mean, and if they'd done this in the civilian system, it's almost a certainty that the judge would have just dismissed the charges as a punishment against the, uh, the government. But of course, the military judge is not going to do that. But the jury came back in and recommended that this guy be given clemency or, or credit for time served, uh, that, uh, which would allow him to be released because of this brutal torture. So it's essentially the same thing where they're saying, OK, we convicted. It's like I said, you're not going to get an acquittal in this kind of system. Uh, but they, they were, they, when, when military guys are outraged over torture, you, you know that torture has been pretty brutal. Okay, the Pareto principle says that 20% of the people to 80% of, do 80% of the work, inventions, progress of the human race. Does the Pareto principle apply to this COVID scandemic? I, I have no idea. I, I, I can't speak to that. Okay. Uh, I meant do not to, oh, he was clarifying this. Uh, I mean, very well may. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. I just, my mind doesn't analyze like that. Okay, the political prisoners that were accused in the January 6th trespass are still held in the DC jails and the video that is held by the Capitol Police is not being shared with defense lawyers. How is this legal? Well, you know, in, in our system of, of government, you have the right to bail. And, and I'm sure that these people that are still in these jails have had bail set. I'm not positive of that, but but I'd be willing to venture that they had bail set. It's probably just set too high and, and they can't get out. Now, I could be mistaken. It could be that they're being held there. I, I don't know what the rationale would be. I mean, uh, a threat to national security or whatever. I, I, I mean, I, I can't imagine that there's a rationale for holding somebody without bail there. Uh, they, they didn't kill anybody. It's not like a, a serial murderer or somebody accused of murder. And uh, I mean, the only person that got killed was one of the protesters, a woman got, got shot and she was defenseless and she got shot to death by one of the Capitol police. Uh, so I, I don't know, I don't know what their, what their rationale is, ex except possibly may, maybe they can't make the bail because it's set too, too high for them. Or maybe it's said reasonably and they just don't have the money. But if that's the case, yes, it's legal. And, uh, but that's where the speedy trial uh, provision comes in, uh, that they can demand a speedy trial. Now, you know, speedy means different things to different people. It may mean 
three months or two months or whatever, but certainly not going to be 20 years. I mean, you're not going to see somebody being held there indefinitely without a trial. Uh, it, it, it just won't happen in our judicial system. You know, as bad as our judicial system might be, there are some, still some good things about it. An indefinite detention domestically is not going to be tolerated by any federal judge. Uh, there'll be a writ of habeas corpus filed, and, and the, the judge will say, try him or release him. Okay, which terrorist destroyed Building 7 in New York City on 9-11? Well, I don't want to get into all that as to, uh, I mean, I think the argument from the perspective of people that don't buy the, that it was an inside job is that somehow or another, the, the concussions or blowing up the building caused Building 7 to go down too. I think that's their argument, but I'm not an engineer, and so I'm not competent to answer that one. Okay, Gardner. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not mentioning your name. Sorry, I mentioned your name. I'm curious to hear what Jacob thinks might be a good approach on a state or local level to combat these rights infringements. Nullification, perhaps, would it be wiser to flee the United States? Hopefully, it doesn't say hyperbolic. Uh, well, you know, I, I'm not one to say talk about flee the United States. I mean, I I, I think let's take our stand here. Uh, it, it's better to fight for liberty here, and I enjoy the fight for liberty. There was two founding fathers that had an exchange. I forget which two. I think Payne, Thomas Paine was one of them. But one of them says, wherever there is liberty, that is my home. <laughs> and I think it was Payne that responded, wherever there is not liberty, that is my home. I mean, because Payne would go wherever there was not liberty. He goes over to France and gets into big trouble over there, stirring up trouble. Uh, so we live in a society where there's not liberty. And, and, and so it's an opportunity for us and, and to, to fight for liberty. And, and, and that's that's you know that can be looked in a positive sense, gives us gives us something to something positive to do in our lives, uh, and and what a great achievement if we're able to pull it off, you know. Uh, all right, and okay, what about uh, jury nullification? Yeah, jury nullification is great, but it, it's really not the answer because, like in drug cases, um, you you don't ever have the chance to to nullify a jury verdict because they 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 screen you out during the voir dire, the jury selection. They'll ask you, does anybody here uh, oppose drug laws? And you're under oath. If you lie, they're, they're going to indict you for perjury. And if you tell the truth, you're, you're out of there. They'll disqualify you. So it's very hard to get a jury of people that don't believe in drug laws. And uh, these other things with the, uh, the military, uh, there's no nullification there because it's the military tribunal that does the, uh, the deal. So the, the only good approach is what I'm talking about, and that's to think at a higher level. How do we get our limited government republic back, which necessarily means a dismantling of the Pentagon, the military industrial complex, this massive military establishment, the CIA, the NSA, they're gone. We lived without these things for 150 years. You had a basic military, I'd say maybe a couple hundred thousand troops maybe, uh, but certainly not enough to, to you know, go abroad and create troubles and go abroad in search of monsters to destroy, uh, as John Quincy Adams put it, uh, just a basic military force. And then rely on citizen soldiers. If in the unlikely event anybody ever invaded the United States, there'd be more than enough American men and women ready to go fight. I mean, a free people, the last thing you want to do is invade a country where people are free. You want to invade a country where they're not free because they're so disgusted that they're not going to fight that hard. A country that's free is like, like swallowing a porcupine. And so the best thing we could ever do is restore a limited government republic, get rid of the drug war, get rid of the immigration controls. And now you're, well, on the economic side, get rid of the whole welfare state and the income tax and the IRS and so forth. Now you're talking about swallowing a porcupine because that's, now you're talking about a free society. Uh, Jacob, the best presentation of the whole series. Well, thank you. That's nice. Question, there was no love loss between Trump and the deep security state. Well, that's true. On his way out the door, now this is a good question. Why couldn't Trump have pardoned Assange Snowden, uh, the, the guy who founded the Silk Road website? I think he's referring to Ross Ulbrich, I'm not sure, and released the remaining JFK documents that deemed secret for the past 50 years. Did they threaten him with scandal or death? That is an absolute fascinating question. Because I said the same thing. Why doesn't he just stick it to him and and uh, and, and pardon Assange and Snowden? I mean, Snowden has they have no business being persecuted like this. The fact this guy's got to live in Russia, this authoritarian state, because the alternative is worse by coming back to his country. 
it's pathetic. It's just pathetic. And the fact that they were planning on ass uh, assassinating Assange, you see, here they are assassinating people because they deem him a threat to national security. What has he done? He just told the truth. He disclosed the truth about the national security establishment. You see how nebulous this national security becomes when they want to assassinate somebody. And, and I'm surprised they haven't assassinated Snowden. I think there's probably some secrets there. Uh, I, I think the only reason they haven't assassinated Snowden is that uh, they they don't know how to get out of Russia after the assassination. It's too dangerous. Uh, and and Ulbrich, I mean, yeah, Ulbrich doesn't belong in in, in, in the, the penitentiary. Uh, and and I know his I know his mother who's just fought diligently to try to get, get her husband, I mean, her, her son, a pardon. I signed a petition to Trump to pardon him, and Trump had nothing to lose by pardoning these guys. And so why didn't he? do that why didn't he re release the the remaining jfk records he could have done that he threatened to do that all the way up to the week of the of the deadline and uh and he didn't do it the, the cia my hunch is the cia came up with a secret like like hoover did with the fbi on people that 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 you know we we, we know this about you we're protecting your secret and uh, it maybe was bad enough where trump said i'll do what you want me to do uh, because Trump did take these guys on. Schumer didn't didn't say this out idly, but yet he surrounds himself with generals. He idolizes generals. Uh, he, I mean, it's just weird. So Trump, Trump, I, I don't understand it to this day. Uh, uh, he he buckled. Trump ended up buckling to the power of the national security establishment, and I don't know the reason for it. It boggles my mind. Jacob, you have been courageous and repeatedly pointing out the national security state, the deep state. I use those terms interchangeably, and so does he, is beyond the Constitution. It is separate from the American government, which we all learned about in school, composed of the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. The deep state has no restrictions on the extra constitutional actions, no separation of powers, no checks and balances, no transparency, all is correct, or open accounting for its egregious invasive behavior. I totally agree. There's no accounting at all. Uh, the deep state is made up of the military industrial complex composed of pentagon profiteers intelligence community corporate surveillance boy this guy ought to be giving my talk here uh contractors of the imperial national security state it sustains with seemingly endless no-win wars which have murdered millions of hapless victims across the planet generating terrorism well this is not a question but it's a great statement generating terrorism that's right that's exactly what i'm point i'm making we made it back at 9 11 as and, oh by the way we were saying before 9 11 that their interventionism overseas we were publishing op-eds saying their interventionism overseas is going to generate a massive terrorist attack on american soil and we weren't the only ones uh there was a chalmers johnson ex-cia analyst who wrote a book called blowback he was saying the same thing and they just disregarded it unconstitutional covert action and preemptive wars of aggression all of which is right on uh, whoever wrote this note needs to give a talk on everything you just said uh, okay, when you say open immigration, can you please discuss? Does it have to be documented or not? Talk about how you see that. Thank you. Well, on the way down here from Virginia, I drove down. And when I crossed state lines, I had no documentation. Man, I had a driver's license, but I mean, that's just for driving on the highways. Nobody stopped me at any state line. Uh, in fact, when I cro <clears throat> crossed at Texarkana, it's kind of interesting because there's Texarkana, Arkansas, and Texarkana, Texas. And uh, you don't see a big bright red line when you cross from one side of town to the other side of town. All you see is a sign that says, welcome to Texas. And uh, there's no restrictions. There's no documents. That's what I'm talking about internationally. No documents. You just cross the international bridge at Laredo like it's a regular bridge, like a bridge that's, that's spanning the Mississippi. There's no border controls at each end of the bridge at the Mississippi. That's what open borders means. There's no immigration control. There's no border control. It's just free movements of people. And it's the only thing that works. I mean, look, what, look how it works in the United States. Didn't have to be that way. Thanks to our founding fathers that made sure that in the Constitution, no state can erect immigration controls or, or, or trade restrictions. You know, nobody worries about the trade imbalance between Florida and, and Virginia. You know, nobody paces the floors. Oh my gosh, there's a trade imbalance here. We got to do something about it. Nobody thinks about that. Nobody worries about how many people are coming from Maryland into Virginia every day. 
Uh, they may be stealing jobs. They may be stealing goods. They may be coming to murder people. They may be terrorists. Everybody just accepts it. Uh, they, may, they may have COVID coming from Maryland into Virginia. Everybody just accepts that's a part of a free society. That's the system we're talking about on open borders. Free moves of people, no, which means then that people can come in, they can visit, they can tour. You won't even know who's an American citizen anymore than you know now. You may see somebody talking with a thick accent. You don't know if he's an American citizen. You don't go up and say, can I see your papers? You know, uh, you go to a fast food place, there's people back in the kitchen speaking Spanish. You don't know whether they're here legally or not. You don't care. All you care about is get your hamburger. Well, within a day of open borders, you would not know who's a citizen or not. You wouldn't care. It'd be just people touring, visiting, getting jobs, renting places, going to Costco to buy things. You notice the Costco never says, we'd like to see your documentation. Uh, they, they just want customers. That's how open borders works. It, it brings harmony. It brings peace. It brings morality. It ends the death. It ends the police state. Police state disappears immediately. And, and you've got this harmonious system. You don't have a crisis on the border anymore. Just have a free flow of people back and forth, just like you do between the states. All right, next question. How do we fight the apathy of Americans who don't really care about this? Some of us are related to or married to people like this. Hey, yeah, I got family members like this. Uh, or I got family members that are conservatives. They, they don't understand this business of drug legalization and open borders and so forth and, and you know opposing the Pentagon and the CIA. Well, he, he, here's my methodology, and this is, this is 32 years of advancing liberty at FFF, and before that, I worked at the Foundation for Economic Education. Before that, I was just doing it as a hobby, and I was practicing law here in Texas. I've concluded that you cannot convince anybody to be a libertarian or to believe in any of these principles. It's, you just not gonna, it's not going to happen. You can do it at your family gatherings at Christmas time, Christmas dinner, Thanksgiving dinner, whatever, but the probability is you're going to end up having a big fight. And so you're better off not doing it. Uh, just, you know, talk about the weather, or ask them what they're doing in their lives and stuff. Now, if they ask your opinion, give it, you know, short, you know, short sense, and, but don't try to convince anybody. Of it. You can't convince anybody of anything. And, and I, I know this because my family members are, are conservatives, some of them, and, and I can't, I can't convince them about libertarianism. And I figure, well, if you can't convince people that love you uh, of the merits of libertarianism, what chance do we have to convince people that don't even know us? Or you, you know, go to a meeting and stuff like that. So you, you can't convince people to become libertarians. Okay, so does that mean that we might as well take the cyanide capsules that we've lost liberty forever, permanently? No, that what I figure is our job is to find libertarians, uh, find people like us. That, that, that believe in these principles and that one liberty, that understand them. Uh, now, we've had, a, we've had a relatively small base of support for FFF. You guys have kept us going for 32 years. I'm very grateful. I'm honored that you guys have kept us going. And, and, but, it, but I'm really, really pleased that these are the people that like our style, that like this principled approach. Well, if you can keep finding those people, and I'm convinced they're all throughout society. A lot of them don't even realize it. They was like me. Before I discovered libertarianism, I didn't know I was a libertarian. But, but what caused me to discover it was finding these essays that were pure, uncompromising libertarianism. And it, it hit me like, a like wow, uh, the most powerful thing. I knew that truth had hit me. Uh, while if I had read some reform nonsense, proposals this or proposals that or white paper this, it would have done nothing to me. It was the power of that principled message. So that's what we need to be doing is finding those people, because I believe that if you reach a critical mass in society of people that understand what freedom is and want it, fiercely want it, they can reach that critical mass that will shift the society. Now, we can't predict how that happens, but I'm convinced that when if a catalyst does happen, that if you've got that critical mass in place, things will happen. The worst thing that can happen is don't prepare for that catalyst. Now, the catalyst may, may never happen. Okay, That's a possibility. But the worst thing that can happen is you think, well, the catalyst can never happen, so you don't prepare. And you say, well, I'm just going to settle for reform. And you stop looking for people that share this principled approach that want really genuine freedom. And then the catalyst hits, and it's too late.
the window of opportunity passes by. It's too late then to say, oh, well, let me go find those people. So what we're doing now is we're looking for people. And how do you find these people? By putting out this message, this pure principled message. When I discovered libertarianism, it was through a series of books that had been published 20 years before, you know, by the Foundation for Economic Education. If you'd asked them 20 years before that, the success of their books, they couldn't point to me because they couldn't predict what was going to happen 20 years. Well, you, you put out these ideas with the idea there are people out there that, that want to be free. They may not even realize it at the time, like me, before I discovered libertarianism. But once they see it, they say, OK, now we've added one more. We've added another one. We've added another one. And so in this way, you're not out there buttonholing people. You're not at the airport like Hare Krishna's trying to buttonhole and convert people. You're just looking for people. And that's why I say that the best thing you can ever do is maintain a principled approach. You go give a speech, you, get, you write an op-ed, you just talk to family members. Don't compromise. Just stand your ground. Don't sit there and argue or get in fights. Just say, no, this is the way I believe. This is why I believe it. That's how I think we're going to achieve the free society. Uh, okay, one more. If you support open borders, how soon can non-citizens vote? Also, do you support voter ID and a stop to the welfare state? Well, the stop to the welfare states is a no-brainer. Of course I do. Uh, starting with Social Security, the crown jewel of the welfare state. Uh, that's, that's where I lose a lot of libertarians, unfortunately. They, 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 they want Social Security. They just want to reform it, or they love Medicare. Uh, and if, you, if you want a free society, you got to make a choice. Do you want a free society? Okay, then you got to get rid of socialism. You cannot have socialism and a free society at the same time. It's, it just doesn't work. Okay. Uh, all right. So yeah, stop the welfare state, but I don't use that as a condition for open borders, which is what some libertarians do that, or and, well, most conservatives get rid of the welfare state and then I'll support open borders. Well, no, <laughs> that, that we, we cannot compromise our principles because of what statists do, because what they're really saying when they say this, that, you know, you, you can't have open borders with the welfare state and Milton Friedman was the most advocate the most prominent advocate of this what what they're really saying with that argument is taxes will increase if if non-citizens go on welfare okay well for one thing non-citizens cannot go on welfare that's the law you gotta you gotta be here for a certain period of time and so forth and moving here is a difficult process if people think it's easy to move here moving to the united states is is not an easy thing to leave family and friends and, and language and culture uh, it takes a very, very unique person to move over here. Uh, but uh, the idea that somebody's going to come over here on welfare, that kind of person cannot put up with the difficulty of, of moving to a foreign country if he's that kind of that kind of mindset. But if it does result in higher taxes, okay, I'm willing to pay that price because if you want to compromise your principles because it's going to cost you a little bit of money, how valuable are your principles then? And what does that say about your principles? That, that, that it's costing you a little bit. There's been people paid a much bigger price for liberty than, than a few extra dollars in taxes. Uh, so uh, another, another problem here is like the drug war. You know, if drugs were legalized, do we, do we, there's no question that some of the drug addicts are gonna go on Medicaid to get treatment. So do we, do we support drug laws until Medicaid's abolished? I'll perish the thought. You got to keep arguing on all aspects of liberty. You know, legalize drugs regardless of Medicaid. Uh, open the borders regardless of welfare. We have to adhere to principle. We have to keep making the consistent case uh, for liberty. Let's not compromise our principles in any sense. How can people have any respect for a movement that compromises principles for the sake of, of money? Okay, how soon can non-citizens vote? Okay, the voting thing, I don't care. Uh, citizenship, I don't care. I, I will let the, the government decide any restrictions on citizenship they want. Uh, to me, it doesn't matter. Make them as strict as you want. That uh, I wouldn't have non-citizens vote. I would have only citizens vote, and and I would I would uh, I would let the government make as stringent as requirements as, as ever. You see, my hunch is that most immigrants don't care about voting. They don't come here to vote. They come here to improve their lives. Uh, they're, they're seeking happiness. Um, and, and if they came here and retained their Mexican citizenship or Guatemalan citizenship, they'd be happy because they're making money. That's why most of them come here. Not say, oh gosh, I came here so I could get to vote. 
you know, one vote's not going to change an election, but a, a nice paying job is going to change the, the fortunes of a family. And so they come here, they retain their Mexican citizenship, they return to Mexico, they come up seasonally. And again, like I said, nobody cares what citizenship they are, except on election day. You know, that's the only time where people have to show proof of citizenship. Uh, today, there's more than a million Americans living in Mexico. They retain their American citizenship. Uh, they don't assimilate. Many, of, most of them don't assimilate. They don't learn Spanish. They hang out only with themselves. They eat hamburgers. Uh, they support the Dallas Cowboys or what is American sports teams. They, uh, they keep their money in American banks. Uh, they vote in the United States and they live in Mexico. Who cares? What difference makes? Should they be required to become Mexican citizens and assimilate? Of course not. Leave people free to pursue happiness in their own way. And the same thing works in reverse. Let Mexicans come here, work, live, invest, or whatever. They retain their Mexican citizenship. If they want to apply for citizenship, fine. Make it as stringent as you want. But open the borders for the free movements of people and then do whatever you want on citizenship. Okay, we've gone long enough. It's 7.30 Eastern time, uh, almost 7.30. I want to thank you all again. Thank, thank you for your great questions in this thing. It's, it's really, really, really astute questions. I really appreciate that. Thank you for tuning into this series. Please recommend it to your friends. Those of you that helped us fund this thing, thank you from the bottom of my heart for funding this thing. I'm just so pleased with how it came out. And um, thank you for your general support. We're sending out end of year fundraising letters right now. I hope you'll consider renewing your support if you've never donated. We would greatly appreciate your support. If you give us $250 or more, you get a personal video message from me every month. Uh, it's a great message too. Uh, it's short, like about 10 minutes. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, we, we really appreciate you. You've kept us going for 32 years. I hope you'll make it 33. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you at the next conference.